so hope all of you are doing well and staying safe. So, and thank you very much for joining this webinar today. Uh, my name is Shomik Siddhanta and I am the webinar facilitator and an assistant professor at the Department of Chemistry, IIT Delhi. And we are very pleased to bring you this content today, which is the part of the online Pratidhwani series that the department is organizing. Uh, the webinar series is sponsored by Author Cafe. Uh, Author Cafe is an online platform that aids in writing, collecting, organizing, collaborating, and publishing your research content through features and integrations with products like Mendeley, Zotero, Orchid, Crossref, and so on. Think of it like Google Docs, specially designed and developed for the academic community, and much more. Uh, today, we are thrilled to have Professor uh, V. Ramamurthy from the University of Miami, USA. Uh, before we start, uh, a couple of technical details. Please do not unmute yourself during the talk. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll try to get at least some of them through to the speaker after the talk. Okay, so, uh, so I would like to uh, introduce Professor uh, Ramamurthy here. So Professor Ramamurthy attended the Government Arts College Kumbha Konam for his uh, BSc degree in 1966. He obtained MSc degree from Indian History of Technology Madras in 1968, following which he pursued his graduate education at the University of Hawaii, Honolulu, USA, and received PhD degree in 1974. He received postdoctoral training in the laboratories of Professors P. D. Mayo, University of Western Ontario, and N. J. Turo, uh, Columbia University. He returned to India to take up an assistant professor position at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore where he remained till 1987. In 1987, he joined the Central Research Division of the DuPont Company, Wilmington, Delaware, and remained till 1994. In 1994, Professor Ramamurthy assumed the position of Bernard Boss Professor of Chemistry at Tulane University, New Orleans. In 2005, he again moved to the University of Miami, Coral Gables, as a professor and chair of the chemistry department, where he is currently directing a group of 10 co workers. During his career, Ramamurthy, uh, Professor Ramamurthy has sought to pursue problems that are at the borderlines of photo, solid state, zeolite, supermolecular, and spin chemistries. In addition to being a faculty at University of Miami, he also served, uh, serves as a senior editor for the ACS journal Langmuir. He has also edited the book, Molecular and Supramolecular Photochemistry. His researches focus on the photochemistry in constrained systems, and he has published over 300 papers. He has also received numerous awards and fellowships, including a fellowship of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 1986, uh, Tulane University LA's Faculty Research Award in 2001, Fulbright Fellowship in 2002, NSF Special Creativity Award in 2005. Cooper, he's, he was a Cooper Fellow in the University of Miami in 2009 to 12. Uh, he, he was also an American Photochemical Society Award, uh, Award winner in 2009. Uh, he's also a distinguished, he also received the Distinguished Alumnus Award uh, from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras in 2010. Uh, he also received the Chemical Research Society of India, India Medal in 2011 uh, and also the Elsevier Lectureship Award in 2014. And uh, he was also the Fulbright Nehru uh, Distinguished Chair uh, uh, during, the, uh, during 2014 and 15. A very warm welcome and over to you, uh, Professor Ramamurthy. Okay, let me sort out all this stuff. Oh. Yeah, you can... I want to share the screen, right? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, uh, just a second. Um... Okay, I see the here share. Okay. Yes. So do you see the screen? Yes. And then let's see what is see. I will get these things uh, uh, cleaned up and then we'll start. Yeah. Um... You see, you see the screen, and then you see the. You hear my voice, okay? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Salvik Siddhartha, for the long and kind uh, introduction. 
I, as uh, already as already you know from the introduction, I am an organic photochemist. So this talk is going to be concerned about uh, how the molecules behave upon uh, uh, excitation with the light. So they go to the excited state and how uh, how and what they do. Okay, this uh, I, I'm going to be restricting myself to one type of uh, uh, medium in which the reactions we pursue. So what I want to emphasize at the end of this talk is the medium uh, in which you carry out the reactions makes a big difference on how the molecules behave. So that that, is, that should be obvious from this uh, title. Okay, why all these things? You know, this, this is not uh, a new thing. This is a very age old um, the concept. For example, lots of biological reactions uh, does not take place in the kind of solvents that we study or we carry out our reactions every day in the lab. There is no benzene, there is no DMSO, there is no uh, hexane in your body. Everything is in uh, water. So all reactions take place in water inside the body, but they are highly specific. And for example, here is Here is a tiny molecule, which is retinol, which is part of the big protein. And then this is what triggers uh, your ability to see things. So this is responsible for vision. The chemistry takes place inside the protein, not in some regular organic solvents. The way it takes place, first of all, this retinol is not water soluble, but somehow it makes it water soluble. This big protein makes it water soluble that solubilizes this molecule. And then, it, it holds it in, in a highly uh, specific orientations and arrangement with the help of weak interactions. That is the interactions between, we call this as a guest and this is a host. And also by restricting its motions, it makes it reactive very selectively. So the reactions, unlike in solution, it does not give rise to some 10, 15 products. The reactions in the body they are highly specific. And the question is, can we achieve something like this in our everyday laboratory? So basically you look around, uh, it is very obvious that the reactions that are taking place inside ourselves or in, in the nature, they are highly specific. Most of them are reactions in water and most of them are in a way it is called supramolecular chemistry. There is one molecule there is a second molecule, and this molecule's chemistry is, con is controlled by the outside molecule. So this is what uh, uh, the whole talk is going to be uh, focused on this topic. Okay. Now we have, I have, we have been in this business for some time. It is not something new. We started about a few years ago. So our goal in this topic has been to carry out reactions. Since I already told you, I am a photo reactions. So we do photo in water, that is our goal. If we cannot uh, do it in water, we want to do it in solid state. Yeah, as much as possible, we want to uh, lower our bill towards organic solvents. And if you want to do all this stuff, there is immediately there is a problem. Most organic compounds are not water soluble and most organic compounds are liquids, they are not solids. So first of all, you have to overcome this very initial a problem. And one can do these things. For example, if you have lots of organic molecules that you want to study, but they are not water soluble, you can make them soluble in water with the help of another molecule, which is water soluble. So that you can solubilize this with some other molecules. And again, if you are, uh, or you want to do the chemistry in solid state, your compound is not crystals, but you still is interested you can adsorb these liquid molecules on solid surfaces, such as silica gel or zeolites, and all of these things can make a liquid look like a solid, okay? So this is our goal. But on top of these things, we want to be sure that the reaction is going to be selective. We are not interested in doing a reaction which is going to give the same set of products as it does in some typical organic solvents. So the reaction, we want to be selective. 
So this kind of chemistry in general, it is basically a container chemistry. So we are going to control. We are going to put the molecule in a small container and then look at the, uh, uh, the follow its chemistry. That is, uh, that is the, the overall uh, uh, goal. As I already mentioned it to you, if the molecule is not water soluble, you can make it soluble in water with the help of another molecule. And there are lots of molecules like this. Okay, in the last about 15 to you know, 25 years ago, there has been a large number of molecules which are people have explored. So simple ones are mysols. Even, even more than the mysols, the cholic acid, which is present in our body, which is present in our stomach. So they are the ones which transport these organic molecules from one place to another place. Dendrimers, if you have the head group, which are water soluble, the whole thing is water soluble. And polymers and a whole bunch of other things. Okay. So if you are interested, you can just uh, uh, take, a look, take a book on supramolecular chemistry. There are lots of host systems with different sizes. Some of these things here are similar. Calixarines, cyclodextrins, cucurbitrals, and all these things are has a small hole in the middle. So you can put your organic molecule, which is not water soluble, inside the hole and drop the whole thing in water. Your molecule is floating in water. So this is like a small boat. If you don't know how to swim, you sit in the boat and then you travel in the in the ocean. So the same sort of concept is going to be. And there are also also there are some inorganic uh, uh, materials which are water soluble. For example, this nano cage, palladium nano cage. There is a number of these kind of things which are known in the last 20 years uh, uh, due to Peter Stang and Fujita and some of these people. They have made this palladium nano cage, which is water soluble. Inside this, there is a big hole. Whenever there is a hole, there is an empty space in which you can put something in. So if this water soluble, your compound, which is not water soluble, it will go and hide itself inside this, like the protein which is a big thing, which is water soluble. There are some empty spaces inside. That's where the organic molecules like retinol goes and sits there. And other types of uh, surfaces, whether the surface that has a, a external surface or internal surface, for example, clay, zirconium phosphate, zeolites, and all of these things has, for example, there's a hole. Zeolite is a huge area in which there are lots of zeolites are known with very different sizes and shapes. So these holes can serve as the, uh, the place where the molecule can stay. So if, the, if you are interested in solid state chemistry and then your uh, molecule is not a solid, so you can use some of these things and then absorb the compound. And ultimately, if you really want to do some highly selective chemistry, then crystals are the best. But, but a lot of compounds may not be crystalline and the packing may not be conducive for reactions. So in this talk, we are going, to, I'm going to be focusing only on one host, that is what is called as octa acid. Okay, first I will give you a little bit of introduction to octa acid, and then we will um, move on. All the host systems I talked about, whether it is a micelle, or whether it is a zeolite or a crystal, you can think of all of them as a big circle. This big circle, inside and outside, are different. Outside, for example, if it is water, this is water. Inside is hydro hydrophobic. And then your guest molecule is going to stay inside the circle. And inside the circle, circle is going to put some confinement on this molecule. So it cannot behave not as normally it would in, in a solution. So its mobility is going to be restricted. Its conformation may be restricted there may be selectivity in reaction. So this big circle makes a big, big difference on its behavior. This should be obvious to the students if they are attending this lecture. If you are at home or in your village or a city, your behavior is very different from if you are at the campus in the hostel. So there are restrictions. So you have to follow some rules and then you cannot be claimed that it is a democratic country. I will do whatever I want. So this is not going to be the case. Okay, so after asking, this is, uh, you know, you don't have to be an uh, outstanding organic chemist to figure out what is why this name. There are eight acid groups, so it is octa acid. Okay, this was made by Bruce Gibb uh, and Corinne Gibb. Corinne Gibb, when I was at uh, Tulane in uh, uh, New Orleans. So this molecule, 
just like cyclode extends and a whole bunch of other things, there is a big hole in the middle, and it is water soluble in a, at a pH of 8.7 borate buffer. So if you put this in water, it has the ability to host some other guest molecules inside. So that's what we are going to be talking about. So before we go too far, you have to have some feeling for what, what is this host. The, the length of this is about 13, and this uh, diameter is about 11, and inside is a big hole, okay? And then the bottom is very tiny. So if I put a drop a molecule here, it cannot come out of this stuff. So it will be stuck inside, okay? But uh, one outstanding property of this host is, unlike all the hosts that are known, like uh, cucurbitrins, cyclodextrins, and calixerines, palladium nano cage, or whatever. All of these are uh, quite popular. This one, two of these molecules will associate and form a capsule. Okay, there is one molecule of this, the other molecule, second molecule of that. If you think in terms of a bucket, there is one bucket and second bucket. The prob problem is this bucket's bottom is very narrow. So if something goes in, it cannot come out of this. Unless this opens, it cannot come out, okay? So what we're talking about is, what we're going to be talking about, the rest of the talk is chemistry inside this particular uh, space, which we call as a capsule, okay? Now, what type of molecules will go in? And a little bit more of this molecular modeling here, it gives you, for some of the people who might want to have a, a visualize where the chemistry is taking place, This picture is useful. So this is the, when you look from the top, this area here, this is like going to the a tailor and who is taking measurements of your uh, shirt or pant. So here is the uh, the width and this side and then the bottom and then the height. Okay. Basically what you need to know is, it is about nine Armstrongs of depth from here to here. And then the width is around nine Armstrongs and the bottom width is about four amps drops, okay? This is all what you need to know, okay? Now, this molecule, as I already mentioned, it is soluble in water as long as it is a basic solution because the COOH has to become COO minus. So if you take a guest molecule, which contains a hydrophobic group and then a hydrophilic head group, hydrophilic means this, is, uh, this has no problem with water. This part has a problem with water. So these types of molecules will form what is called as one to one complex. That means if you have this molecule in water, if you add a little bit of this in water and they will stay together. And in the process, this will form a one to one, one host, one guest. Suppose you don't have this top portion, which is not hydrophilic, something like this. Now this part cannot be exposed to water. It doesn't want to be, for example, this long chain, it doesn't want to face water. So what will form? It will form a capsule. This is where this particular host is extremely useful. So it forms, for example, adamantane at the bottom and then this part at the top, and then it forms what we call as two to one complex, okay? And for example, if you have a molecule which does not have any of these things, like adamantane, a small molecule, this still doesn't like water. So it will form a two to one. If you put a little bit more, it will form two to two. So basically, it can this molecule after acid can form one to one, two to one, two to two complex. Okay. So the two, the first two is for the host, second one is for the guest. Okay. So that's how we'll uh, in the during the talk we'll mention these names. In terms of the size of the molecules that can fit in, for example, naphthalene two molecules can go in, anthracene two can go in. And you can see already anthracene, this is hitting on that side and that one is hitting on this side. Now, if you make it a bit bigger, then there are no, two molecules cannot go in. So it will be tetracene, only one. So this is the longest molecule that can form. If, you, if the pentacene is ideal, because these days, pentacene is very popular molecule in terms of the triplet, uh, uh, triplet annihilation or singlet fission and all this, but unfortunately, that molecule doesn't fit here. So tetracene is the longest, about 12 Armstrongs. And in terms of the width, you can put one benzene ring here and maybe one more here, but then beyond that you cannot put, for example, pyrene, it can fit in. 
And then if you put one more benzene here, no. So from this picture, you can get what sort of, you know, if you have some plans to do the kind, kind of chemistry, then you have to know before you start whether the guess you are thinking will fit in or no. So the molecule that can fit in, it has to have a width less than about <coughs> seven Armstrongs, this one, and the, the length less than 12 Armstrongs. If it is more than that, you know, this is not the right host. Okay. Now, our, uh, uh, this is, let's say, if you think this, this is a boat, this is the occupants like you inside the boat. The question is, the boat is in, floating in water. Is the boat inside the boat is filled with the water or no? Okay, so we can figure this out. We can find it out. So there are a whole bunch of molecules which shows what we call as polarity dependent uh, emission. Okay, this is a little bit of a photochemistry. So all these molecules, there are many more molecules. The ones I, we took in the early days, I'm showing you here. All these molecules, emission spectra, some, you know, there are various features of the emission spectra vary with respect to the polarity of the solvent. We have done all the experiments. And the final conclusion is, if you have a guest in water, this is alone, now the pyrene can sit inside. And, and then when it does sit, all the water molecules are kicked out. So inside of the pyrene is completely nonpolar. So there are no water molecules inside the capsule. That is based on the spectroscopy and the EPR studies we were able to uh, show. Okay, that is one thing that, uh, uh, you know, the first things. Okay, over a period of time, we have studied quite a, quite a number of uh, uh, molecules and features and uh, try to establish various uh, uh, f concepts and the use of this capsule. And the summary has been published in Accounts of Chemical Research about five years ago. Okay, so here there are three molecules, okay, still be azo compounds. And this is the one that is uh, uh, a part of the uh, GFP proteins. And all these molecules undergo isomerization, and then we showed that it is different inside the capsule. Here is a molecule which undergoes oxidation. Chemical products are different inside the capsule. And here is a molecule which does not show phosphorescence. It can show phosphorescence. So anyway, so there are lots of different uh, mo uh, yeah, uh, molecules we have investigated inside, and we have shown each one's chemistry is very unique inside the capsule. That is the, uh, at the end of it, the message is, when chemistry take place in a confined space, it you cannot extend it from what you study in a textbook. Here is nitrine that you can generate by elimination of nitrogen, or carbene, or you can eliminate nitrogen, you get a nitrine, and these things you study in a textbook to be highly reactive. But if you generate those things inside the capsule, you can save it, and then you can take spectra, okay? So what I'm going to talk today is only one of these uh, things, and that is this molecule here. That is the chemistry of anthracene. Anthracene photochemistry is pretty old. You know, and it is almost ancient. About uh, 100 years ago, the first studies on anthracenes were published. So, but still you can dig and then you can get something uh, uh, interesting out of these things. That's what I'm going to talk to you, okay? But also, well, uh, we have also uh, established a different type of feature of these things. So if you have, for example, a molecule inside trapped, that molecule or the, a molecule that is present outside, that is you have your molecule closed in a box and the molecule that is sitting inside the box is able to talk to the molecule that is outside. We have shown these things by a number of different features. For example, we have studied this by there is a spin-spin interaction between this radical and that radical by time resolved EPR. We have also shown, for example, energy can be transferred from inside to the outside, and that can be electron transfer from inside to the outside. So this wall that covers this molecule does not completely mean this molecule is isolated. This molecule it still has life. It still talks to the other molecules outside. It can talk in terms of electron transfer, energy transfer, or spin transfer. And this part of the studies have been summarized in uh, Langmuir feature article some time ago. Okay. 
So I'm not going to talk any of these things, whatever has been uh, already published. So I will talk only about the anthracene story. To follow the story, you don't need to know a lot of things. I will try to, ho hopefully I will try to tell you uh, in a language that you can follow. So the th three molecules you have to remember, octa acid, anthracene, and the dimer. No other organic molecules you need to know. And then this talk is going to be touching upon several aspects of uh, the study. We will talk about excimers. You have to, excimer is excited state uh, complex. There is no complex in the ground state. In the excited state, there is a complex. The concept of excimer, again, is very old. But you might be wondering, if it is too old, why are you wondering about this? So but the, my goal is to show that there are, sometimes there are interesting features which are buried inside something which already has been uh, studied before. Okay, anyway, there is a host guest complexation, and then there is some uh, aspects of this particular talk is going to touch upon the NMR, and about steady state fluorescence, ultra-fast spectroscopy, molecular modeling, quantum chemical calculation. So it is a combination of several, several of these things uh, I'm going to talk about. And as you already probably is aware, I, I cannot be an expert on all of these things. So there are lots of collaborations in many of these topics. Okay. Now, you know, before I go, I am I have been in this business for, as I already mentioned. I got my master's in 1968, and this is 2012. So I have been in this for a long time. Things have changed nowadays. Everybody wants to do things which are ap applied. So it has to cure cancer or produce a new energy source or something, something. But then I heard a lecture by Ahmed Zoyal uh, several years ago, but almost 10 years ago. So making new knowledge is neither easy nor profitable in the short term. Fundamental research proves profitable in the long run. And as importantly, it is a force that enriches the culture of any society with reason and basic truth, because there is always a struggle between uh, basic science and applied uh, science. It is much easier to tell somebody I am finding a cure for cancer. You may not find the cure, but you can keep talking about it and people keep listening to you. But then if you if you go and tell I'm working on XMRs, they don't, they don't even know what are you talking about. Okay, so there is a, my point is the basic science has a future. That is where the future is. The applied science is based on what has been already known. Okay, so, so you can, I don't have to emphasize this. And for example, this uh, uh, words I take, took out of this lecture is, uh, it illustrates this. And one more, before we go too far, you know, there are musicians, there are modern music, cine music and all kinds of uh, music, but still these people, these people are classical musics. Musicians, for example, Ravi Shankar or Bombay Jayasri, whom you might have heard of. If you are, all these people, they are still very popular, and people listen to this music, and so there is a there is a place for uh, old stuff. There is basic science, or it is not old, but it's something new or something classic. Okay, so I just want to emphasize this point to the students because oftentimes the students thinks if you are doing basic science. You know, it, it has no future. Basic science is the one which has the future. Okay. Anyway, first of all, what is XMR? XMR was first of all was discovered in 1955. It is quite a long time ago by this person, uh, Foster. Okay. And then, at that time, he discovered XMRs, which is an excited state complex. You know what is the ground state complex? Two molecules, when they aggregate in the ground state, they are more stable than being alone. So that is the ground state complex. But some molecules are, they form complex only in the excited state. That is one excited molecule and another ground state molecule. If they are in solution, they want to be together. They don't want to be separated. That is called as XMRs or XIPLEX, okay? So at that time, he illustrated this with uh, pyrene, and for the next 20 years, every person wanted to uh, record an XMR emission from something or the other, okay? So one of the things that uh, people, you know, anthracene is a simple system, because anthracene's photochemistry already has been known for 50 years. So they started with anthracene. These are, 
But then the atrazine, when you irradiate this, it dimerizes. It goes to the quant dimer. This is the structure I showed you. The quantum yield is 100%. But then, in the meantime, when people were studying excimers and dimers, so there was a, always they, they thought this molecule first in the excited state forms an excited state complex and it dimerizes and goes to this compound. But some of them are stable, some of them are not stable. But in the case of anthracene, this excimer was not stable. So there was no emission in solution from anthracene. You know, people have struggled to see this anthracene excimer emission. And you know, many, many big names were involved and they were not able to see this stuff in solution, okay? Now, uh, Ed Chandras, who was at Bell Labs, he's a pretty well-known person. Uh, he's, he devised a new approach to this uh, excimer emissions. He took this compound in solid state crystals and then irradiated and then it falls apart. And when it falls apart, these two molecules are close to each other. And then in the crystal state, they cannot dimerize. And then when you excite it, it shows excimers, but it happens only at 77 degrees Kelvin. And then you have to start from the back. You want, if you take the anthracene and then excite it in the crystals, no excimers. But if you start from the backside, and then you can get the excimer. This is the first report of excimer emission from anthracene and was published in 1966. That since then, there has been lots of uh, reports on this and there are lots of reviews also. Uh, okay, so. Now, after about 10 years, again, Yen C. Yang is a very famous uh, photochemist who was at the University of Chicago. He showed, okay, I can take anthracene and dissolve it in uh, chloroform, and then I can record the excimer emission. He said, oh, this is, look at here, this is the excimer emission. Okay, this is a very small emission, and the concentration is 0.2 molar. At that concentration, you know, how, who knows how much impurity is there? And later on, unfortunately, this was shown to be an impure emission. It is not really from anthracene. It is from something else. This was uh, uh, N.C. Yang. Uh, and then many other people, they tried to do this stuff, but then they were not very successful. Okay. So emission from anthracene excimers is uh, still unknown. Okay. Now, what we did was we took anthracene in water. We are not talking about anthracene in chloroform or benzene or any of these in water, and you get this emission. Whatever this emission is, this looks like a monomer emission from anthracene. And then we added the uh, up acid to water. And immediately what you see is a very strong, broad emission, which is characteristic of excimers. This was done by Sirisha, who was a PhD student at that time. She graduated almost 15 years ago. Okay, so we were all excited at that time. Uh, you know, this is a, well, everybody else before us were saying, oh, you can never see a, a anthracene excimer, and here we are, we are just seeing it in something very really unusual water. Okay. Okay, now, to be sure that this is real, we measured the lifetime. And again, going back to your Chandras, and some, many other people, if you go to the chemical reviews, you can see some number of reviews on this topic. So this is uh, the excimer of this, what we, they call it different types of excimers, sandwich excimer, that means one on top of each other. It has a lifetime of about 220 nanoseconds. So we measured the lifetime of our sample. This is the decay of the anthracene inside the octa acid, and then it has a lifetime of 263 nanoseconds, which is pretty long. So we are in the range of these excimers. And then if you record the emission, time result emission of this, somewhere along this uh, uh, time range, 50 to 70, then what you can, clear, you can clearly see that is the XMR emission, okay? Now, so we have recorded XMR inside the octa acid. So what's all this? How did we get this stuff? Because, you know, it seems like it is very unusual and we just left out. Now we wanted to go back and look at the structure and more details, okay? So this is where NMR, this could be something interesting for the students who have learned some about something about NMR. Here, this is octa acid. There are all these peaks here, which is star, and it belongs to the octa acid. Okay. 
Now we put this uh, anthracene. This is all done in uh, D2O uh, water. You add this anthracene, and then what happens is you get corresponding to the anthracene, you get the peaks. This numbered peaks, one, two, three, four, five, it, co it corresponds to this. So when anthracene goes inside the octa acid, inside the in water, you have peaks corresponding to the host and corresponding to the guest. And if you look at the guest peaks, if you study a little bit of NMR, aromatics are supposed to come somewhere in this region, seven to eight. And you see here, all the peaks are between three and 6.5. So everything has completely shifted up field. So that tells you something. That's the first uh, uh, thing. That tells you the molecule is not in water. It is inside the octa acid. Okay. And then if you measure the integration, you can get the stoichiometry or how many anthracene molecules and how many host molecules are involved in the complex. Okay. According to the integration, it is one to one. One to one, that means one host, one guest. But you have to remember, when you say one to one, it can be two to two, three to three, four to four, okay? That is, uh, so if you look at the possible structures for this uh, complex, it can be one to one, one to two, and then two to two, and then again two to two, okay? There are two things that you have to remember. The, what we have seen is, the stoichiometry is one to one. And then that means this is this is not going to work out. And then the next one is the, the guest has got five signals. So some of these things are not right, okay? So here, first thing is, if it is one to one stoichiometry, it can be this complex or it can be two to two. Both are correct, okay? And if you now say, I saw only five signals, and now that this one is not going to be correct also. So the only two possible structures for this host guest complex is going to be either this or that, okay? This is a good exercise for the graduate students to learn about NMR. Now, what we did was we did the uh, two, 2D NMRs. That is, we tried to figure out the connections between these peaks that we see. So there are five peaks. In this compound, if it is a five peaks, for example, this one is inside the capsule and these are outside the capsule, outside this host. Outside the host, there is no need for these things to shift way up field here. The only hydrogens which will be shifted up field is because of this host, which contains a benzene ring, if you still remember the structure. The benzene ring, uh, they can provide a shielding and that is what is shifting these peaks. So. The fact that you are seeing five signals and some of them are not, everything is shifted up field, tells you this structure is not correct, okay? Now, and also we have, we have assigned all the peaks, so I don't want to go through all the details here. Now, if you do the NOE, you can figure it out about the relationship between the various hydrogens. That, was, that is what we did. We, we did the NOE, According to the nuclear overhazard effect, 2D NMR, this hydrogen and that hydrogen are close to each other. It is impossible because if you look at the structure, they are not close. So the only way they can be close to each other is if it is something like this, this hydrogen and that hydrogen. If you go from this side is one to five. If you come from that side it is one to five. And those two hydrogens are close and that is exactly what is uh, this NOE is telling you. When you do the NMR NOE, it tells you number one and number five are close to each other. And it is only way is it has, it is like this. The other possibility is these two things may be top of each other. If it is on top of each other, it will be symmetrical. Then you will get only three peaks. You will not get five peaks. So based on all of these things, our based on the NMR, our conclusion is the molecule has a structure like this, okay? So we, at this stage, we, I decided to talk to one of my colleagues, Raji Prabhakar in the department. We did a molecular, he did the molecular modeling with the help of the student Gaurav. And this is the structure we got. This is exactly what we thought of guessed from the NMR. There are two anthracenes. And then as you see here, they are slipped. They are not on top of each other. And this is, you know, all these details are here. So this is the beginning.
of the little bit more details on these compounds on this excimer chemistry inside the confined space. Okay, now we looked at this emission a little bit more closely. Uh, this is after Sirisha is gone, and then this is only the last maybe three, four years. We decided to go back to this compound. So at the very beginning in water, if you remember, there were a monomer emission. And now if you add the octa acid slowly, then what happens is this emission comes down and then this emission goes up. So this is the excimer emission, that is the emission from two molecules is going up, the emission from single molecule is coming down. Okay. And then this is uh, going from the anthracene is about five micromolar and then we are adding the octa acid, all it done in water, the zero to five. Now, if you continue to add more, what happens is, now if you continue to add more than this uh, for five micromolar, and then you become greedy, you hope that you can ca catch everything. Now what happens is this emission comes down. Now this emission goes up. Okay, there are two emissions. This is a monomer, excimer. The, uh, the ratio of these two is, is controlled by the amount of octa acid in solution. But if you somebody who is looking at very closely the spectra, you can see this one and that one are not identical. Okay, I will tell you what is what, what does that mean. Okay, I am trying to make this lecture more of a uh, educational rather than trying to show that uh, you no, know, I can do fancy things. But I just want to, the students to follow what's going on here. You just how to analyze the spectra and what sort of information you can get. All these. So if you look at these things, at the beginning, this goes up. And then you keep adding more and more and comes down, this goes up, okay? Now we need, we need to know there are three spectra here, one, two, and three. What exactly are these? From where do they come, okay? All right. So we go back to the NMR again. It's because we are now seeing three different types of emissions. First one is the empty octa acid. And then if you add a little bit, what we get is a one to two complex, one anthracene inside this. That's what we saw in the emission. We saw the monomer emission. And there are high, the peaks which are marked here. I don't want to go back into the details of this. And then if you keep going, adding more and more, now two of these goes in, then you get, uh, you can control the amount of this one to two and two to two complex by controlling the ratio of anthracene to octa acid in water. Okay, let's see, uh, uh, that's a, the message from this slide. Okay, now this is one emission, that is the one to two complex, this is the emission from that. And this blue one is the, what we call as excitation. It tells you from where the emission is coming. When you record this emission, you have zero idea what is emitting. So then you take the excitation, compare it with absorption, then you see from where, what molecule is emitting and all this, this one is emitting from here. And then if you find the condition in which you have two to two complex, the emission that you see is very different. It is the same anthracene, but then the amount, depending on the amount of octa acid, the emission completely shifts from here to here. And then if you look at the excitation of this, and then you look at this, this is the excitation spectrum and the absorption spectrum of this complex. It is not identical to this. So there are too many things going on here. So if you really want to understand, you need to spend more time. And this is what we did. Okay, so here, this is the absorption spectrum of this complex, that is this one. And then this is the excitation spectrum of the complex. Oh, this is the absorption spectrum of the other complex and they are not identical. And then if you take the XMR excitation spectrum, that is the excitation spectrum of this. I think for people who may not know what I'm talking about, excitation spectrum is somewhat equivalent to absorption. So the XMR excitation, and if you look at the absorption, they are identical. So it's the same anthracene. It has two different absorption spectrum, depending upon where it is. If it is with another anthracene, it absorption spectrum looks like this. You know, you might say, okay, they are very close. What are you talking about? No, but these are, this, although it is very close, it is not identical. If it is not identical, that means something else is going on here. 
Okay, so if you look at the XMR emission and the monomer emission, again, you can see they are not identical. Okay, so what does it mean? All this stuff. Okay, so this is where Pratik Sen and Aritra Das, you might know these people, they are close to you, they are at IIT Kanpur, and they are uh, ultra fast spectroscopies. So uh, we did this project together from here on. So we decided. To look at this a little bit more closely, what is happening upon excitation inside the capsule? That is, you know, in solution, people know what happens. If you have it in benzene or some other solvent, people have studied, it, it just shows fluorescence, no excimers. Okay. But inside this confined space, now we see excimer. And if you look at this excimer, this is what we call as on the bottom is the time scale and then the intensity of emission, and then this is the decay. After it is excited, the emission is going to disappear. How fast it disappears, all this tells you a lot of information. It has a lot of information. So the excimer emission, if you notice, it takes a little bit of time to build up. This is what we call as rise time. If it is coming immediately, as soon as you excite it, if it is going to if it is going to start emitting, that means the emission should start here, like this. This is the monomer emission. And whereas the excimer emission, you excite here. It, there is a little bit of time to start emitting light. That means something else is going on. After we excite this from anthracene, it has to do something to start emitting like an excimer. Okay, so that is the idea. And if you look at these excimer emissions, if you look at the total emission with respect to time, again these are done in sub nanoseconds, uh, picosecond time regime. At the very beginning, you see this emission. As the time goes on, the emission keeps shifting. Okay, this is very, very unusual, even today. Okay. So, if you, for example, the, the, I showed you one emission as a, okay, and I put the compound in, inside the octacid, I see one broad emission. That one broad emission is true. But if you start recording this with respect to time, that is not completely true. That the emission is from slowly shifts with respect to time. That means there is something is going on in the time, but these are very short time scales. This anthracene we excite, and it is interacting with this. That is what we call as excimers. And there is a little bit of time delay between you know, emission from excimer emission to that starts happening. Well, if you look at this a little bit more, if you have a lot more very detailed questions, if you are a chemical physicist and you want to know a lot more details, Pratik Sen is uh, close by. You can just give him a call or send him an email. Okay, here, for example, this one should have, if it is very smooth uh, transition from here to here, this line would be yeah, a very simple line. But if you notice, there are some kinks here and there. That tells you mo motion from here to here. It is not very smooth. There's something else is happening. Okay, so we decided to uh, uh, look at this more closely. One point I want to emphasize here, if you go to any organic textbooks, including the recent ones, they will tell you the monomer emission, excimer emission. They will plot a picture like this with respect to time, and they will have monomer emission. This excimer emission will keep increasing with respect to time, but the position does not change. It is always the same place. Okay, but these are all. But that is not true. What I'm going to tell you, this is not what happens inside the capsule. You can, in fact, record the molecule moving from here to here with respect to time. That's what uh, uh, Aritra and Pratik, uh, they did. Okay. This has been, the, in solution, this is what people have reported over and over. Okay. Now, we, I tell you what is uh, the, the same picture. Now, what happens is, as I already mentioned, we excite the molecule here, and then the, the anthracene is moving towards the another anthracene. When it moves closer, the emission is going to shift from monomer to excimer. It takes a little bit of time, maybe about 0.5 nanoseconds. And in this time range, what is happening? There are many, many things are happening. So what happened as the molecule, this is where we start. We excite the molecule. Other anthracene is getting closer. That means the this is the distance between two anthracenes. And then as it moves here, now this excited state, this is a more stable positions. And that's where the emission is going to start. But if this pathway is very slow, this is not like a, a, a regular 
a trunk road, it is a road that you see in the villages, then the molecule is going to struggle to move. And as it moves, then it can start emitting. And as it emits, the wavelength is going to shift. That's what happens here. So we were, able, we were able to show that inside the capsule, the pathway is a lot, lot more uh, tortuous compared to if it had been in a solution, okay? And we did this little bit more uh, details. This is, these are the two. Now, if you look at this with respect to even shorter time scale and much uh, closer uh, time scale, the emission spectrum looks like this, from start from here and then end, end up here. But then there is an isobistic point, iso emissive point, okay? And then you go some more. And so this is one first step. So it mo molecule starts from somewhere here and then you end up here. And then at some place, there is a, a, a stopover. And to get to that place, it takes about 0.06 nanosecond. That is the time. Uh, and then from this place, we, we start again and then record the spectrum. And eventually we get here. And even that one is not a smooth moving from here to here. As you see, there is another stopover. And that one, to go from this stopover to that stopover, it takes a little bit longer. So inside the channels of the capsule, the mo two molecule, one molecule starts, moves closer to the other molecule, and they together they start moving. And then now they are struggling to move along the capsule. And we can, we can capture all of this information through this time result uh, studies. That's what uh, uh, Pratik and uh, Aritra did. And to get this little bit more, uh, some picture here. So our, to begin with the two anthracene, you know, we, and by NMR, we showed they are not top of each other. If it is top of each other, it is very simple. That is a, that it is struggling to go to that structure to, that is the most stable structure that is here. But then it is starting from a place looking like this. That is what NMR said. That is what the molecular modeling said. And from here to here, they have to come closer. They have to move this way. And also they have to move that way. So excited. And then this is going over a small barrier, come to something else. And another barrier, come here. And then you see the emission. That is the ultimate prompt. But since this whole place is a little bit slow, we can see the emission from everywhere. And that is what happens in the picture I showed you before, okay? Now, at this stage, we, we were not sure when we excite this, are we exciting the two molecules together or are we exciting only one molecule that is excited and then that molecule is the one which is moving closer. To figure this out, we did what we call as, we added a quencher outside. This is a very unusual feature. I mentioned it to you at the beginning. You can communicate with this molecule. Although it is locked up inside the capsule, it is willing to talk to something which is outside. So we did this by using this methyl viologen. And then when we added this, there was an electron transfer from anthracene monomer or dimer. And then we can record the methyl viologen radical cation. And as you see here, that one goes up. And then the time it takes for going up, the time delay is about 5.3 picoseconds. That is the uh, time it takes to pick up the signal from the methyl viologen. And then if you remember, to form the excimer emission, there was a time delay. That is, so this is a excimer emission starts emitting and then the, it is decaying. On the other hand, when the electron is getting transferred from inside to the outside, that takes about 5.3 picosecond. There are two different time scales. This is 400 and 5. So that means we are not quenching the excited state of the excimer. We are quenching something before the excimer. So what we believe is we are exciting this molecule that goes to the excited state and that molecule is transferring the electron to the uh, biologen that is outside. Okay, I will finish up in about five minutes or five to six, five to, five to seven minutes. Okay, so we got some details. You know, for some people, you know, why all these details? What is the big deal about all this? But this is a very basic understanding of how molecules behave when you put them in a small space and where, where the, the spatial confinement is there, where the roads are not uh, uh, thorough. If it is solution, all these things would have been very smooth because this molecule going from here to here, it is going to be diffusion. There's, there's, there's nothing stopping them 
uh, on the pathway. Whereas this molecule moving towards this is the su surroundings are really making it very difficult for it to move. So it takes longer. As it takes longer, we can monitor these things by uh, time result spectroscopy. Okay. So at that stage, at this stage, okay, we got the NMR cleaned up, and then we did the uh, time result spectroscopy. All of these things seems to be giving very similar information or uh, complementary information, reinforcing our concept of excimers inside the capsule. So we decided to look at these things from a theoretical point of view. And again, you might know Vardarajan, Srinu Vardaraj, Varda at uh, ISR Bhopal, and his students, Bajit. So they, we did computation, and he did the computations and based on the studies of Pratik and then Srisha, who did the you know, early studies on this compound. So this computation is not that easy with this kind of system because there is a too many more, too many atoms. So it has to be that has to be simplified. So the the capsule it has got a whole lot of atoms about 368 atoms. If you have done a little bit of calculations, you will know going beyond hydrogen atom, hydrogen molecule is a pretty challenging task. With 368 is, a, you know, I don't know, is there a word for challenging? I don't know. It is uh, not easy. And then, so we did this by uh, molecular mechanics. This is a similar to what Rajiv did with respect to getting the modeling. And then we focused mainly on the two anthracenes that are inside. That is what we wanted to know. We are we are already know much about this capsule. How do those two molecules move inside the capsule? For that, that part of it, Varda uh, did by quantum mechanics. Okay, if you want the details are here, and now, so what is going to happen is the two anthracenes are sitting like this. What we want to know is how much will it move along this direction, and then it has to move along this direction. And then it has to come closer. There are three steps for this whole thing to give rise to the excimers. So how does it? Uh, what what is the the potential energy curve for all these motions in the excited state? That's what we wanted to know. So if you go to the literature again, you know there are lots of people who work, who work on these kind of topics. There are people who work. We think that everybody is working on nanoparticles or material science, but there are lots of people who work on pro pro projects like this. So the guys who did who does this XMR emission of anthracene, this was a recent paper. They say uh, XMRs can be like benzene-like, that is two benzenes are overlapping, or two naphthalenes are overlapping, or two anthracenes are uh, anthracenes are overlapping. So there are three types of XMRs: anthracene-like, naphthalene-like, benzene-like. So in the gas phase, all three are possible, and people struggle to see the emission from all three. Okay. So, so this is the ground state. The, the red line is the first excited state, second excited state, third excited state. And in the gas phase, the calculations by Varda and the student, Sujit, Subhajit, it shows all three, benzene-like, naphthalene-like, anthracene-like. And you see the minimum, that is the most stable one in the excited state. The, the ground state, it doesn't matter. Okay, but in the excited state, as soon as you excite one of them, what happens is it doesn't. It wants to go get closer, and one, if it, one of them gets closer, it is this one. Two gets closer, anthracene and anthracene. Anthracene like is the uh, most stable one in the gas phase. That means the whole molecule moves, get closer, and then also slips a little bit uh, along the b-axis. Okay, so this is the gas phase. What happens inside the octacid again? Now putting the molecule inside the octacid is the, the calculations becomes challenging, and now, so what we he Varda uh, and Busubaji did was to. This is the structure of this molecule which we did from the molecular uh, modeling as well as from molecular mechanics. Uh, Varda did this uh, initial uh, geometry. Now we try to move this along the a axis. That means bring it closer. Now this is the ground state. If you go to the excited state, if you bring it closer, it actually gets the energy gets more stable. Now the, the goal is to figure out which structure is the most stable structure in the excited state. Does it look very similar to what we think it is based on time-resolved spectroscopy and NMR and all this stuff? 
Okay, and then if you move it along the B axis, that is, you move this anthracene along this axis, you can see this is the ground state. And then if you go up again, this is not the most stable arrangement in the excited state. In the ground state, this is the stable. In the excited state, it actually moves a little bit on this side. And then if you go again, because you have to move all three, we, we can do only one by one. That's what, uh, so when you move it from here, you can see the excited state. The more another one is here. Okay. So now the question is <clears throat> so if you take this, there's an aphthalene like, anthracene like. But ideally, what happens is all three should be moving. But unfortunately, for our computation, we cannot move all three at the same time. So we moved one by one. And the last one is you can see we got the minimum, minimum distance for the A and B <clears throat> from the earlier calculations. We put those numbers in and then we move the C. That means, okay, let's, I don't know whether I have the picture we are talking about here. So we got the arrangement A from this figure and then we got the B from this figure and put that number and then we try to uh, move this and then see which one is the most stable one. So if you see this, you can see, now you can see after in like, anthracene like, we excite the molecule it goes up and then goes over the barrier. That is not the case in the normally in the solution. The, the in solution, in the case of normally when you excite, it will go down very quickly. But here there is a barrier and then from there it emits, okay? And this is the gas phase, this is in solution. The gas phase is different from solution, okay? Now, at the end of all this, what we think happening is we excite the molecule and then it goes up to the excited, first excited state or if it goes to second or third, it will come down to the first. And then as you see here, this is the same picture that uh, we had from the time result studies. Now it goes over the barrier, comes to one stop and then it goes over the second barrier, goes to the final stop, from there it emits. And this is, the, this is if you look at this picture, it, it has a similar features not exactly identical, partly because we, the, the, the computations are much more complex and the, we are only using three coordinates. The molecule has a large number of coordinates. You will have to adjust a lot of these parameters to get to the right picture, but at least, at least we got the hang of this stuff. Okay, so that is the, so to conclude, the XMR, XMRs of anthracenes are possible inside the confined space of octa acid and how it is produced, the details you can get. And then it is uh, a combination of theory, some uh, conventional NMR, uh, one dimension, two dimensional NMRs, and then uh, ultra fast spectroscopy all put together gave rise to some kind of a, a model for the behavior of molecules in highly confined spaces. This is just a, one, but you can imagine this is exactly what probably what, hap what happens inside the uh, various types of proteins. Okay, I am going to stop with this slide. So what happens is in solution, this is already I told you, two anthracenes when you excite, it dimerizes. There is no excimers. And then when you take two anthracenes inside the octa acid, it, it does not dimerize. There is no dimer it shows excimers. So you can completely change the chemistry from one to the other by boxing up the molecule inside the capsule. Okay. And, you know, this is no difference from, uh, unfortunately, you know, if somebody does not behave properly, then what we do is put them in a prison and hope their behavior improves or it changes. Okay. So, here, the reason for our this is going back to the original picture. This is the this is the uh, capsule, or you can think of anything. And this is our molecule. And this molecule, upon excitation, it wants to expand. It wants to go to a dimer, but there is a bar all around it, and so it cannot go. Now it says, okay, so it chooses a different path. Okay, I will. I bet because it has a lot of energy, it has to dissipate the energy. It does by emitting light. Okay. All right. So with that, I'm going to stop. Let me see whether I can get out of this slide here.
I want to go to the last slide. Okay. I'm not sure. Do you see the slides? Uh, yes, uh, we can see the slide. Uh, probably okay. can make it full screen. Uh, you can see the whole slide? Yes, yes. Okay. So, what I talked to you, uh, it, has, it has been published in JAX uh, this year. And the, the initial observation was made by Sirisha. We published in JAX in 2005. Well, no, it, and, in between, and we also studied the diverization of this molecule inside the octa acid again. That was uh, last year published. Because I just talked about mainly about this paper today. So I didn't want to talk about a lot of different things and then make a whole show that we can do lots of different things inside the octa acid. But I thought choosing one would uh, make things a little bit easier to follow and appreciate the kind of chemistry that can be done inside the confined space. So at the end of it, the, the project is uh, funded by National Science Foundation. And the people who are involved in this project are here. I, here and there, I mentioned the name. Okay, I don't need this stuff. Sirisha is a, 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 all these one, two, three PhD students uh, Sirisha is the one who did the uh, very early observations, but very uh, uh, unusual. Mohan Raj and Ashwini, they finished up the lot of this emission spectra. Pratik Sen, who is a faculty at uh, IIT Kanpur, Anitra Das, who is a PhD student, they did all the time resolved spectroscopy. And Varada and Subhajit uh, at ISR Bhopal, they did the computation. Rajiv and Gaurav, they did the modeling. And Bruce Gibb is the person who made the octa acid. I think with that, I'm going to stop and then thank you. All right. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramamurthy, for the interesting, insightful, and exciting uh, talk. Uh, so, uh, can we have a few questions from the audience now? Oh, if you agree. Okay. Sure. So, do I have, am I supposed to see something when I am? When you... No, no, I think uh, the no, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, so please do type in your questions in the chat box or you can just raise your hand so I can unmute you. Um, so any questions uh, for Professor Ramamurthy? So, yeah. Well, something happened, something for some part of the thing froze. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, Professor Pramit. Uh, Professor yes, Ramit, can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Professor Ramurthy, thanks for the wonderful talk. I have a question for you, which okay. is, uh, which is, see, I understand that uh, when you have these two molecules in the confined uh, geometry or confined space of oxy mm -hmm. acid, so you, you enhance uh, excimer formation. And then you, then you show that there, uh, it, it is if there is a tortuous uh, set of uh, pathways through which the examiner is formed. Mm -hmm. So my point is, if you would manage to increase the confinement space, would you still, uh, or would these molecules still be facing the same type of hindrances in terms okay. of examiner formation? Okay, so. The octa acid, you know, it is a, it is a, a O-spec cyclic exchange of cucurbiters that fix the features. So right. if you want to increase the, you will have to put another molecule along with the uh, anthracenes. So you will have to include some uh, three different molecules, or you will have to make a different octa, different type of host. So unfortunately, the synthesis is not that easy to make the this kind of host. So uh, so we have not made any other hosts uh, smaller or larger than this, and you can do a lot of this kind of chemistry. For example, with uh, with the cucurbiterols, if you are familiar with that, or cyclodextrin, right. they have alpha, beta, gamma, things like right. that. There are different sizes, but the problem with them is the top and the bottom they are open, they are not closed. 
So the molecules can escape or they have lots more freedom compared to the upper acid. So that's why you don't get the chemistry inside this typical uh, typical hose, which are well, uh, cocorbutyl is very popular. Cyclodextrin was very popular, maybe like 10 to 15 years. So with the octa acid, uh, you don't have that kind of flexibility of synthesizing different sizes. Okay. And if you, you know, if you make the capsule bigger or smaller, things are going to change. So you think that it is uh, really because of uh, the confinement effect that um, the octa acid is bringing in. That means if I would try to mirror the same with say a solution of known viscosity, would I be able to uh, replicate uh, the study? Well, you know, I mean, our about... solution can be a little bit viscous. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, if you are talking about other. Uh, Viscosity or the that is the that is the that is the one that is giving this uh, effect. If you go back to the very original paper by H. Chandras, that was done, for example, in uh, crystals. They they took and then they broke the the crystals of the dimer in 77 right. degree, 77 in a glassy matrix. Basically, you know, it is a very one way of looking at this is a very high, very, very highly viscous medium. So it is like a, putting something in a rock. So if you can find something, this, this is somewhat similar, you know, sense. But it, but inside the octa acid, there are also other things. It's not only viscosity. There are interactions between the benzene rings, the walls of the octa acid, and the uh, the guest molecules also. There are some pi pi interactions. The Van der Waals interactions. So those are the other features which might also be including these motions. Absolutely. Thank you, Professor Ramon. It was very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. any more questions uh, for Professor? Maybe I can ask Professor Ramurti Ashok here. How are you? Sorry, Hi, I how are you? because our That's board okay. meeting went on for three and a half hours. So today was wow. our board meeting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you, you may be remembering Dr. Chidambaram is our chairman. He was in. Oh, uh, oh he's uh, okay. Yeah. Atomic energy person. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know him because he was. Uh, uh, he was a close friend of uh, Professor Right. Yeah. I think they may have been classmates. So, uh, yeah, I will ask you some. Yeah, I, I may be odd question. Uh, do you see this kind of enzymes uh, in non-planar systems? Any okay, non planar any, means you are talking about uh, see the excimers are usually happens in the aromatic molecules, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So it is not so it, uh, only yeah. aromatic systems, is it? Yeah, mostly, and then there is something else called exciprex that means you know, excimer is basically excited state. Okay. So, if you have two molecules which can interact uh, by orbital overlap, they can give rise to this excited state complex. So, there it doesn't have to be one molecule can be like an alkaline, the one can be amine with an electron. Uh, so, there, there, there can be a excited state complex. They are called as exiplex. They are, they are it's a pretty different name. The other thing is, do you have multiple, uh, you showed mostly it is. Uh, uh, two molecules, right? Correct. Is it possible to have more than that? Of course, the size of the molecule has to be smaller. Uh, may not be uh, your tetra. Uh, you know. Four. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to have three, oh, uh, which join okay. together? Or? For the excited state complex, usually two molecules. Because, you know, as if you remember the uh, kinetics. Two molecular collisions, the probability is very small. Very small. Are colliding. So if you have two molecules already colliding, one more come to collide in the time scale of the excited states is uh, you know, it, it, it probability is close to zero. So that it doesn't happen. So no no example in picosecond level. Okay. okay. So for example, if you talk of in terms of the solid state, it can happen. They are you know there are multiple molecules can interact. They are the the uh, aggregates, the, uh, the various types of uh, nanoparticles, type of things, multiple things they overlap, like uh, H aggregates, K aggregates. They are 
Yeah, they are uh, more than two. So, you know, lots of them are, uh, they interact. Okay. So anyway, I, those were my some questions. Just if uh, Professor Chidambara or Dr. Chidambaram is in uh, good health. Yeah, he is okay. Although he must be 85, 86. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He must be in that age. Yeah. So I have no more questions, Omik. So if you have somebody else, has it. sure. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ganguly. Uh, any any more questions uh, for uh, Professor Ramuthi? Uh, okay, so we didn't uh, get any text in the chat box yet. But I, I, I just wanted to add one or two lines, uh, Professor uh, uh, Ramuthi. Thank uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. So well, thank you. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah, Professor Ramurthy, uh, we were in ISC when you were a faculty. I was a student and then we met in DuPont so a long time. And uh, I am very nice to see you. And of course, from DuPont, you went to Tulane and then to Miami, University of Miami. So, uh, and our students have done PhD with you earlier, right? Uh, Mintu Porel, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's I at IIT Paracard. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, but I don't know any other student. Uh, I remember her. Uh, yeah. So I want to tell all the other <clears throat> participants. So Professor Ramurthy has been really leading a photochemist in the world. And uh, several review articles are there. And as you see in his talk, it was a highly interdisciplinary. Uh, you talk of confinement and then you talk of spectroscopy. And uh, then, of course, you talk of organic chemistry. Uh, so everything is involved, you know. And of course, solid state is there. So uh, he was one of those earlier solid state organic chemists because earlier process, uh, you know, solid state was mostly made inorganic. But uh, Professor Desi Raju and Professor Ramuthi, I remember those days, the solid state organic chemists, I remember those days starting with uh, Professor Desi Raju and Professor Ramuthi. That's a very nice talk, uh, very interdisciplinary, and many things to learn. Thank you, Professor Ramuthi, for accepting our invitation. Hope to see you sometime. Yeah, sure. In the so US. thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Ashok Ganguly. As, uh, as Ashok mentioned, I knew him as a student at IAS in Bangalore, and then I met him as a postdoc at uh, DuPont, and then I met him as a professor at uh, uh, IIT Delhi. And then I met him as a director at uh, Mohali. Uh, is I'm I'm meeting him back again as uh, uh, deputy director or uh, one of those uh, administrative positions at IIT Delhi uh, online. So hopefully I will see you in person someday. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah, so before actually we leave, uh, there is a question from a student. So mm -hmm. can we take that? Oh, just... Yeah, sure. So what is the driving force behind pyrene replacing the water molecules within the octa acid capsule? So this is this question. OK, OK. So lots of the or organic molecules, they want to go inside the octa acid or any kind of host. One of the driving force is the hydrophobic effect because the organic molecules are not water soluble. They don't want to be in water. If there is a chance, they want to go to a place which is where there, where there are no water molecules. So that's what happens in the uh, proteins. Because all of these molecules which are not water soluble inside our body, they go inside the protein, that's where the chemistry goes on. So protein in a way is a, a matrix in which the chemistry <laughs> takes place because the, the simple molecules, they don't want to be in water. One of the driving forces is hydrophobicity. Okay. It is not the attraction. It is actually distraction. Yeah. Okay. So this question was uh, from Vishal Jyoti Rai. Right? Uh, he has another question. So is it general behavior of such capsules to shield the protons of uh, the entity inside, such as anthracene? Okay. 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 So <clears throat> this kind of, uh, if you again, if you remember your uh, NMR course. You know, if you have a benzene ring, it has a shielding region and a defielding region. If something, another hydrogen comes on top of the benzene ring, it will be shielded. 
So it will uh, the, the the chemical shift will go upfield. If it's on the side, it will go downfield. So the if you look at the octa acid, it has got a lot of benzene rings on the, on the bottom. So as long as you have that, it will shift the hydrogens. And there are other uh, posts like this. Uh, uh, the one of the famous leading person is Julius Riebeck. He's at uh, Scripps. He, he also makes this uh, post, and in his systems also the hydrogens will shift. But unfortunate thing about his host is it doesn't form a capsule. That's where yes. the <coughs> ours is uh, slightly uh, different. Is that uh, does it answer the question? Yeah, I think he said. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so I think the last question is. Uh, uh, so it's from Sana Zara. So she is asking uh, that uh, uh, that has the deviations uh, in the excimer emissions is a result of interaction of guest molecule or is it negligible? So uh, mm, no, I didn't uh, understand the first. I could read it again. Uh, so uh, so she says that I have a question that that has uh, that the deviations in excimer emissions is a result of interaction of guest molecule or is it negligible like the deviation in excimer emissions okay i think okay. the shift she is asking probably the shift, okay. Yes. Right. shift okay so what happens is when you look at a book they will say that they will have a monomer emission and excimer emission the excimer emission will not show you with the time dependence but here what happens is the the, the the rate at which it moves, it, it is slow, or at least the emission rate constant can compete with the the speed with which it is moving towards the next next anthracene. So it is able to compete. So because of that, you see various emissions with respect to time. So the maximum is different. So that if you go, I don't I cannot go back to the 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 gap between the ground state and the excited state it actually keeps going down. So when it goes down, the gap, you know, the wavelength is uh, getting longer and longer. So that's how, with respect to time, the emission is shifting. In solution, it is not. It is not the case because in solution, the, the it is controlled by diffusion. It is taking longer time. So all these things are over. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, we can conclude the uh, Q and A session now. Uh, okay, so, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, uh, President Ramurti, again uh, for accepting our invitation. And uh, hopefully, when everything, all this COVID crisis is over, we can, uh, we hope to host you physically sometime in our institute. And I would also like to thank uh, Professor Anil Elias, our HOD, uh, Professor Ram Ramaswamy, and all the senior and junior faculty members. Uh, for their constant encouragement and also uh, professor uh, and support and also professor uh, Janaki Ram and professor Bisodu uh, for co-organizing this web, uh, webinar series along with me. Uh, so on, uh, yeah. So over to you, professor Ganguly, if you want. Uh, to thanks, uh, professor Ramurthy, once again. And as uh, Somik said, we will be happy to host you when situation improves. I hope you have got the vaccination. Pfizer yeah, I got probably doing well in US. And so we also got vaccinated, of course, with the Indian. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ashok, for inviting me, thinking of me to give the talk. So okay. I hope uh, it is something that you people found it useful. Uh, yeah, I think it was a very interesting talk, as we, I, I'm sure everybody liked it. So thank you okay. again. Okay, bye. All See right. you again. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yeah. I think you, I don't know how to. Uh, you can just close your laptop or whatever. You will. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, I think. Otherwise, there is a cross. Uh, you know.